Brothers and sisters, welcome to our sermon for today as we go through this series. If you remember last week, we talked about uh, Peter as he stood next to that coal fire, that this place of warmth was where deniers congregate, that this place of warmth was where Peter moved towards and twice denied his friendship, his loyalty, his following, and his love of Jesus. It's where we too sat and warmed our hands as we reflected on how we too deny Christ by the commands we choose to deny, the actions we choose to obey or disobey, and how all of them declare that when we choose other than him, we choose to deny him. Today, as we continue through this path, this journey that John takes us on, we enter into the crowd and the trial as well as the private invitation to enter into Pilate's quarters as he speaks to Christ. Two places, two different settings, one with a group, one with an individual, but both surrounded by the same declaration, the same motive, and the same desires. So I'm going to read for us John uh, 18, 28 through 40a. We're We're not going to go all the way to B, but we're going to stop there at A. So this is John 18, 28 through 40. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourself and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea? Jesus asked. Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews gathering there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we praise you, for your word, for your truth, for the hope that it gives, for the challenges that it speaks into us, reminds us of, and the challenge of the truth too as well. And so, Holy Spirit, we pray once more that you intercede, that you open up this text, that you speak to us, that you declare the truth of Jesus Christ, that you remind us of the work that he came to do, the life that he lived, the love that he gave, the harm that we cause, and the very reason why we need him. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What is truth? These words have always had a space in my head, and and when I think of Lent and so much outside of Lent, those words, what is truth, come to me. And, and so a lot of times someone will, someone will even say, what is truth? And I instantly think of Pilate's, what is truth, his retorts. It's the words I think of when I think of Pilate, but it's the words I also think of when I think of faith and relationships and people and life. By definition, truth is the property of being in accord with fact or reality. In everyday language, truth is typically ascribed to things that aim to represent reality or otherwise correspond to it, such as beliefs or propositions and declarative sentences. Truth is usually held to the opposite of falsehood. 
I don't think I would find anyone who would disagree with those understandings. We all agree on what truth is, but do we all agree on what truth is? Can truth be partial or does it have to be completely true? Can it be true to me and not true to you? Does truth have to be true all the time or does sometimes make true true? And what happens when we reject truth? Does that mean I'm rejecting something that is wrong or just not the truthful portion for me? Society more or less states that truth can be whatever I want, whatever works for me, whatever makes me feel good, whatever the majority says, or whatever I can comprehend. So truth apparently is all of those somehow at some point or something, which then essentially states truth is relative. Is that what truth is? Because that means there is no standard to truth because truth is my truth and doesn't have to be your truth. And we can sit in our own truths and not have to agree on what truth is. But then that only works for me because if you tell me your truth doesn't have to be my truth, then that to me makes it a lie. Your truth is a lie because it doesn't match with my truth. So now truth is dependent on how I feel and what is convenient for me, as long as I'm stating what truth is by my definition and not yours. It feels like a really weird philosophical in-depth conversation that goes nowhere, that just circles around to no truth, if you can follow along on all those words that I said. <laughs> Makes sense in my head, as usual, a lot of things do. Maybe not spoken so eloquently. In our text today, uh, there's a scene of, or scenes of the crowd and Pilate. And there's so much going on, and yet the consistency throughout all of this is the truth. And honestly, it's the rejection of truth. So let me set the scene for us, because it's important. This whole thing is, is not only based on lies and trumped up charges, but it's based on the rejection of truth. From Caiaphas to the Jewish leaders, to the Jewish people, to Pilate, everyone is circling around what truth is, and everyone is deciding that truth for them is what works for them. So really, it's not about truth. It's about me and the lies I tell myself for the truth that I want to hear and feel. So the scene. The Jewish council didn't have the right to do to Jesus what they wanted to do to Jesus, which is why they wanted him to die. They didn't like what he was saying, the words he was doing, but they couldn't do what they wanted to do about it, so there's trumped up charges. So after Caiaphas has kept him at his house from the previous night, so if we remember from last week, um, Peter and the other disciple have taken have followed Jesus as he's been taken by these Roman soldiers and these Jewish official, officials into this this area and ushered into the house of Caiaphas when they're kind of hanging out. So he spent the night at Caiaphas's place, assumedly being grilled and drilled and prepared for the next morning to go in front of Pilate. So they then take him to the palace of the Roman governor, to the pra Praetorium. But because they're worried about their ability to participate in the Passover, and the cleanliness of what that would look like and mean, they stay outside the gate. Concerned with traditions and the festivities and image, you know, the image I have, all those take precedence over someone's life. Abiding and following what the Mishnah states and, heaven forbid, what would people say if I had to be gone for a week because I had defiled myself, thus unable to participate in the Passover? What would they say about me? More concerned about them than Jesus, they decide to keep their distance. And so Pilate comes out and asks, what charges are you bringing against this man? Which is a really interesting question, not because of the words, but because of the words. So here stands Jesus before Pilate in the praetorium, in the kind of courtyard area of their governor, and the Jews are around as well. And the charges we read for having him there are actually nothing. <laughs> so what we have to do is we then go to Luke 23, 2, and re we read that there are three charges against Jesus. Subverting the nation, opposing taxes to Caesar, 
and claiming to be king. But when we look at our text, what we see is, is just the proclamation that verse 30, he's a criminal, not, it's not a charge, it's not even true, but it's the charge they first declare. We then jump to verse 31b, we read, he's a criminal who needs to be executed, but we can't do it. Again, not a charge, but it's the second part of their declaration that he's so bad that he must be executed. And then we jump two verses ahead to verse 33, and it's Pilate asking him about this kingship kingship that he's heard about. So once again, clearly he's, Pilate is, is fully aware of, of everything that's going on. But when we really dig down to this, when we sift through all of this with the Jewish people and the officials as, as well as Pilate, we begin to see that all of this is based on a personal interpretation of what is truth and what is not. The relationship between Pilate, so if we go back here, the relationship between Pilate and, and the Jews is one based on ranking and power and the desire to keep it that way. Well, the Jews is based on personal and cultural desires as well as power and wanting to keep it that way. So in a way, we have two people reading their own truth and doing everything in their power to maintain power and truth for their own personal benefit. It's what Pilate's doing, it's what the, the Jewish officials um, and the chief priests are doing as well. So while the Jews are declaring their self-actualized truth and seeing Jesus for who they want to see, Pilate is declaring Jesus and his own truth of who he is, Pilate's understanding of who Jesus is, not based on what the Jews declare, not based on what Jesus responds to, but again on what Pilate declares and wants to hear. And in the end, both the Jews and Pilate declare truths in their own way. And then those truths are then, if, if we take those two here, those two truths are then held up against what Jesus declares is truth. And all three can't be right. So what is Jesus' is truth, right? We don't actually have much from Jesus here. He doesn't say a whole lot. We have Jesus asking in response to Pilate's, Pilate's question about being the king of the Jews. We have Jesus' declaration that he has a kingdom, thus he is a king, just not of this world, but we know he is a king of this world. And we have Jesus ending with saying that, yes, he is a king, and that truth, real truth, not your truth, not their truth, but real truth, points to this fact. Jesus says that he comes to testify to the truth. But again, what is that truth? In short, that truth is Jesus. His testifying to the truth is that he is a king. His kingdom is not of this world and that he is the son of God. His truth is that he came to save those who listen and obey to the truth, thus offering salvation to them and anyone who rejects that truth, rejects the truth and stands in judgment. But we can go further than this. You know, we, we, we have scripture. We can go further than this. The letters of 1 John declare that Jesus is the truth. Those letters also declare that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit declares the truth and that the declo declared truth points to Jesus Christ. 1 John 2.21 even declares that there can be no lie that ever comes out of truth. So the truth is always truthful. Thus, if Christ is truth, then there is no lie in him, no lie ever spoken. Revelation declares Christ a king. Again, pointing us back to what John and the other Gospels declare. Second Thessalonians declares that those who refuse to love the truth are not saved. Specifically, and to the point, Jesus back in John 14, 6, so just four and a half chapters back, says, I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. Three people. Three truths. One is right, one is wrong. So who do you believe? So, reminder, Pilate, the one who is concerned about staying in power and his personal desires in life, thus accepting his truth and rejecting Christ, do, you, do we follow that truth? Do we trust the Jews and the officials and the Pharisees who are concerned about an upheaval to their system, their culture, their ways of life, their own desires as accepting their truth, and again, thus rejecting Jesus? Or do we stand with Jesus 
and his declaring truth of who he is, that he came to testify to the truth, which is who he is, what he offers, and the kingdom he reigns over. But like last week, before we answer that, because I think our, our, our initial just kind of want to dive into is, is Jesus, Jesus is the answer. That's true, it is. But before we answer that, let's, let's think about that ourselves. Because while we're quick to say, again, Jesus, we have some explaining to do. So let me ask, what is truth? I'd like to give you an answer to a, a moment to answer that, but I know I'm talking to a camera and the camera is not going to speak back. But, but does truth that we declare, does that accept or reject Jesus? The question throughout all these weeks is not only sitting in these moments with John, with, with Jesus that John gives us, these times that lead us to, with Christ to and through the cross, but really the reality that if we're going to sit here, then we must be present in the text. We don't want to insert ourselves in the text, but recognize where we are. We must not only drink in the words, drink in the actions, but see our role, right, into this, into the scene, into, you know, set things in motion. And so with that, I want to sit with the crowd and not just sit listening to Pilate, but sit as Pilate. Because while those two moments are different, while their own truths are different, it's, it's really, again, the same. Same people, same desires, same wants, different scenes. Because they all want truth to be relative to them for their need in that moment. And in truth, you can't just reject Jesus sometimes. You either reject him fully or you fully embrace him. You can't just have a little contaminated, contaminated water. It's either contaminated or it's not. And as I think about all that we've been through this year, all we've been through for many, many years, this reoccurring theme we've heard, this reoccurring theme we've seen and lived into, this reoccurring theme in our text is truth and our acceptance of it or rejection of it. I mean, that's been the headlines for years. What is truth? How do we know it? What do we reject it? Where do we drink it in? From QAnon as of lately, to COVID, to science, to um, news and politics, to my family, to my neighbor, to all of those in between. Each and every day we are inundated with making up our mind about what truth is and what truth is not. What information do I receive? What information do I accept? What information do I reject? And all of it, we filter down into how that truth fits into what I want. It's why it becomes important to recognize the truth that I hear from the biased places I get it from, right? We all have biases. And so if I'm only getting my news from one source, I need to understand that news source and where they are. If they have a foot in this side of the political spectrum or or and not this, or they're fully in this and not in this, or they're not trying to find some balanced place, then I need to understand that the truth I'm hearing comes from this or this filter. But then there's also the truth that the truth that I want to know and I want to hear that I believe wholeheartedly. And so when I hear things, I will grab onto some of the truths that affirm where I am and reject others. I was listening. Um, I, I find most of my news source, um, I'm hoping is from a good place, is NPR, even though I don't spend a lot of time in the car. Um, I do when I'm going to sit to pick up my kids for something or, or waiting for them from, from some event. Um, I listen to NPR. Um, and I was listening the other, just last week, to an interview between this this lady who was trying to build a bridge with this other lady who was fully invested in the QAnon conspiracy, conspira conspiracy. And she was trying to understand where this QAnon lady was coming from and how she could believe what she believes in this lady's self-actualized truth, that there were people in politics who were eating babies. And I specifically remember her asking, you believe that there were politicians who were eating babies? And she said, absolutely. 
that you believe that the shootings in the schools and other locations are staged hoaxes, that even 9-11 was a staged U.S. attack on itself of these truths that you find. And the lady was absolutely, yes, I do. And it was painful to listen to as this QAnon person was so entrenched in their own view of what truth was that she was unwilling to move or discuss. That while in this dialogue, these two ladies agreed from the get-go that their hope was finding truth and having that bridge from where I am and you are, that we can meet together in our, in our, in, in our, in our desires together to find truth, that we can then move forward, right? They were both hoping to find truth, and yet they were both hoping that the other person, their truth would be changed so that you could see my truth. Well, the other person was saying, I'm hoping you disregard the lies you feel are truth so you can see what the real truth is, which is the truth that I declare. But that's, that's an easy one, right? QAnon, conspiracy theories. I mean, they're called conspiracy theories for a reason, right? Those are what we call a layup conversation. We may not be like them, but how are you and I like Pilate or the Jews? the chief priests and the officials in our view of Jesus. Because we all distort truth. We do. But how many of us or how often are we actually going to go down the path of how is my truth changed or altered? Or how do I alter truth when it comes to my faith, when it comes to my Lord? Let me give you some examples. How many of us lie about being the Christians we tell people we are, or we allow them to assume that we are. How many of us lie by declaring Christ with our lips and yet our hearts love money more, our homes more, our jobs more, our relationships more, our status more? That's pretty much all of us. We say that Jesus is number one. I even have a, a sweater that says, God first, family, then the Seahawks. But if I'm gonna be honest, I move those around, interchange those pretty easily. How many of us lie about our love of Jesus? We love him, we go to church, we tithe, we even share with him with others, but man, I love me. Thus, I will come first. Pretty sure that's all of us. What about we go to church, but we only go on Christmas Eve or Easter or when it's convenient for me? Or we go to church, but we don't engage. We don't speak into the church. We don't volunteer. Because that would mean I'd have to do more and be more and invest more. Maybe even change my life more. And so Sunday, Sunday only becomes more convenient. What about tithing? But when I tithe, I only give this amount. Or maybe we don't tithe, but we, we give everything else. And then once everything else has been purchased, once my necessities have been done, once the toys I want have been purchased, once the extracurricular, extra additional things that aren't necessary, but... I want them, I don't need them, but I want them, are purchased, then I'll tithe. Thus, it's not my first fruits anymore. It's not that I've sat down and said, here's how much I make, here's how much I'm gonna give, here's my percentage I'm giving to the church, here's what I have for my bills and everything else, my first fruits, but now I'm giving my third fruits, my fourth fruits, my fifth fruits. So really, it's not about giving to God his, it's about giving to God what's mine that I don't feel I need right now. How about the fact that we'll share the gospel with others, but only in the comforts of certain locations when surrounded by certain people, and again, only when convenient for me? How many of us are doing things for my approval, 
or your approval of me, but not God's. Thus rejecting him, we seek the approval of each other. Thus rejecting his truth of reign on my life, thus I tithe only what I want. Thus, the list is long. And doesn't every single one of those work against whom we claim Jesus is? Is our daily desires of me and my wants any different than the rejection of the Jews and Pilate of who Jesus was? When Pilate brought out Barabbas and offered the people Jesus or, how is that any different than the options you and I are faced with every single day where we choose Jesus and his truth and are living into it? Or, so Jesus then is held up against my desire and my self-truth in this minute and my desire to live into that. And why is it okay that I feel okay choosing me over him? Why is it that I fail to see that that as my flat out rejection of Jesus? Because that's what it is, isn't it? Anytime I choose me over him, anytime I choose me over you, anytime I choose to do what I want over what he declares I should do, is that not rejecting everything about who Christ is, what he came for, the role he supposedly has in my life and the life that I'm called to live? How could the Jews not see the truth when he was standing right there? Their own oral tradition and scriptures declared this man is the Messiah and that he will come, and yet they rejected him. How could Pilate retort with, what is truth, when truth was standing right in front of them? How could you and I reject truth as often as we do? We talk about how dark this world would be without Jesus, how much chaos would be without the truth, and yet each and every day we choose darkness, we choose lies, we choose truth only when it is convenient for me. What is truth? Some people spend their whole lives looking for truth and never find it because they're wanting what they declare to be true to be true. So they'll read scripture, they'll climb to the tops of the mountains, they'll seek out gurus and sages and come away disappointed just like the rich young ruler whom Jesus said to give up everything and follow me. The one he was saying, make me your God, not your wealth, your God. Once more, there is only one truth and it's Jesus and his way and his life. And we cannot take Jesus and cram him into our lives when and how we want, when it's convenient for me. We don't take Jesus and try to mold him and conform him to fit into my lifestyle, my choices, and my desires. Last I checked, Jesus doesn't say, I'm here to follow you. It's quite the opposite. He says, come, follow me. Jesus comes down to us. We don't come up to the Father. The Holy Spirit is here to point to the Father and the Son, not to point the Son and the Father to you, to me. The truth, the truth is that we want Jesus how we want Jesus. But when we do, when we do that, we actually reject him. Which means we reject him every day because we're trying to create Jesus to be someone or something he's not. The truth, the truth is that Jesus doesn't waver on who he is at all. He is, he was, he always will be. He stands firm and true and does not change. You and me, we're like chameleons. We'll adapt to whatever it is. And that will be our truth in the moment. But that truth can change as soon as I'm ready for that truth to change. One author uh, writes about this Greek understanding of truth. They state that the Greek word for truth means to unhide or hiding nothing. It conveys the thought that truth is always there, always open, always available to be seen with, with nothing ever hidden or obscured. And the Greek understanding actually matches beautifully with the Hebrew word for truth, which means firmness and consistency and duration. Such a definition implies an, an everlasting substance, something that can be relied on, relied upon completely. So when we take those two words of, of truth, those two understandings, truth is this everlasting thing that is out there for all to see. It's this everlasting 
truth that's available for all to see, that is unhidden. So what is truth? Well, if truth is something that always is, doesn't change, can be seen by all, truth is you and I can't be trusted. Sorry to burst your bubble, we can't. That anytime we say something untruthful, anytime we lie, anytime we choose an option of, of me over Jesus, anytime we choose the option of me over you, anytime we reject Jesus as our, the Lord of our lives, anytime we seek power in this world, we thus live into the rejection of Jesus and his claim. Thus we are not truthful. It's amazing how we can even trust one another. <laughs> the truth is, if Jesus is truth, then everything he says is truth. Which means his kingdom is of a different place. That he did leave his throne and come to earth. That he did come to redeem the lost and the forsaken. That he has come to judge the living and the dead. That he is the way, the truth, and the life. That he rejects my lies. That he was despised and rejected by humans. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. That he did die on the cross. That he did atone for my for my rejecting lies of him, that he does forgive me, that he did raise from the grave three days later, that he has given me, given you eternal life, that he came to stomp on the head of Satan, that he will come again and finish the job, that he, that the spirit testifies to him, that the spirit binds us to him, that the Holy Spirit draws us to Christ, that the Holy Spirit convicts us into his truth, even when I try to work against that truth. That we can never undo his truth, no matter how many lies we tell, no matter how many times we reject him, no matter how much harm we do. That God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish from their lives, from their lies from their self-righteousness, from their deceit, perish from their daily rejection of truth. But instead of receiving that which they deserve for the rejection of him, they shall have everlasting life because of him. That's how we sit with the rejection one, the rejected one. We recognize our rejection of Jesus who came to be the rejected one because we had become the rejected ones by our sin. So by his coming, being who we are fully without sin, but taking on our rejecting sin, he unrejects us to God. I want to close with 1 Timothy 1.15. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you fully aware of our daily rejection of you and truth, fully aware that we will break and bend things to our will, to our desires over yours of us each and every day. And we know it's wrong, and yet we find ourselves too often faced with a direction to take, and we choose the wrong path. We choose the wrong direction. Forgive us, Lord. Remind us of the goodness that we are faced with and the truth that we are to declare and the hope that we have that we know we can't do without. And we praise you, Lord, for your truth, for your work, for you're not rejecting us for our lies and our self-actualized truth. And that nothing we can do can undo the truth of your love, your grace, your work, your forgiveness, your redemption, your payment of our sins. Holy Spirit, we fall upon you and ask that you give us the strength and courage every single day 
to live into truth, to declare truth, to be reminded of truth, to fall upon the truth of when we do mess up, and we know we will, that the truth is we are already forgiven. We ask all these things in the name of our Father, through the love of the Son, and the daily work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless.